All right, Fr Friday Fudge Company, hello, how are you? Let me pull the camera nearer. All right. I was, late. I'm, I was a couple of minutes late, I'm sorry. Uh, Molly, hello, how are you? Um, White Pine Chocolates, hello. Um, who else have we got? Ollie, hello Ollie. Sorry, I'm just setting my camera sorted out. Um, who else have we got? Hello everybody, how are you? Sorry, yeah, I was a little bit late. We went to... Um, Went to look at a um, went to look at a property actually uh, for lease and it's a uh, it's an old bank and um, complete with safe and it was just a little bit eerie um, and it's a little bit weird it, and like the safe had a kind of chair in the middle of it with the bars and it just kind of looks like a, a an execution chair <laughs> you know when you walk in somewhere and you go well I'm not really sure well yeah the moment we walked in we we're like oh I don't know I'm not really sure so. Um, yeah, that's kind of, yeah, so I only literally just made it back in time. Uh, Mr. Sledgers, hello, sir. I, it's 3 a.m. where you are, and you join. So um, let me send a couple of waves out. Um, is it having? They're not having the waves. Who else have we got? Fancy Nancy, hello. Um, and who's got there? Angelica, hello. Um, move your bum joined. Hello, move your bum. Uh, chocolate lover, hello. Gosh, there's loads of joints now. Um, so yeah, so as I said, we we went to have a look at a um, we went to have a look at a property that's for lease, and um, it's an old bank, and it was a bit um, yeah, gave me the gave me the shivers. So um, yeah, it, it was yeah, we'll see how we go. So we've got Nadia, hello, uh, Lizzie, hi. We're going to wait for Mother Baker. She's going to come on in a minute and say, sorry I'm late. Um, Molly, hello. Great, thank you. Painting in DIY plus your chocolate live winning. Definitely. Um, painting, like a bit of painting in DIY actually. I like tinkering. I like just being doing stuff. Um, hello from Israel. David, hello. How are you? Uh, Mother Baker's there. Um, and Mr. Sledgers, good morning. So I've had some really, really good um, questions this week. So uh, what I'll do at the end of the live, I will write down, I will write down what I what I covered in this chat tonight. Um, and I've got a list of questions that people have sent me during the week, and so, some of them I've already answered. Some of them I'll go through because I think they were interesting anyway. Uh, Mother Baker's telling us she's here and on time. Absolutely fine. Um, and Mr. Sledge is all the way from Bali in Indonesia. Uh, you run a you run a big hotel there, don't you? So, um, but welcome. I think he, I think you said it's three a.m. So you've obviously <laughs> oh he's down here. But um, I don't. I guess we're going to be on about forty minutes or so. Depends on how many questions we get tonight. Um, so, a couple of things I was going to do tonight. One, if you saw my Instagram stories, stories, the, my Instagram stories, you saw that. Um, I did some stuff towards Halloween this week, and one of the there's a few shells there, right? So basically, they got they they're like the eyeballs. My daughters call them the um, dragon eyes, all right? Many varieties of this uh, going around, but I'm just gonna I'm not gonna show you one. I'm actually gonna talk through how I did that, if that makes sense. Uh, grab a brush. Um, grab a brush. So. Um, if you have a look at the ones that are on the, um, if, yeah, if you have a look at the ones that are on the stories page, so basically they were, as my daughter's called them, were dragon eyes, all right? So, um, can I need a dome mould for that one. Uh, something, it doesn't really matter. These ones have got slightly straight sides to them. This one has got slightly straight sides to it. So, basically, what it starts off with is, um, let, me get some, let me get some butter. So, the... The eye that's right in the middle of it, it's quite an easy, um, it's quite an easy this one. Melissa Chocolate, hello. Um, who else have we got? Just a few hellos before we get any further, let people join. We've got about 35 here at the minute, so um, happy days. Okay. So I hope you can see, I hope you can hear. Um, I've got everything's all. Come to a right? So, um, really straightforward. This one, it's quite a nice design. It's probably good for like like Halloween. Very very slow process though, right? So it's not a quick kind of spray and go and uh, spray shell. You know, tip them out. But in terms of a design, it's quite nice. So all I did, 
you can use two options here. You can um, you can spray so temper black butter, right? So you can just spray a dot straight into the bottom, and and let that dry. Alternatively, you can just take your black butter, do a dot in the in the bottom, right, and just swirl it round until you've got a good covering on the base. Then let that dry, right? So that's the first bit of that one. The next bit, if you wanted to do uh, a, like a proper eyeball, so you have the dark pupil and then you'd have the blue, right? And then once that's set, you put the blue on top of the black. Once the black's set, you put the blue on top, swirl that right, and then you do white. If you wanted to put the kind of little red, um, uh, I don't want to call them hangover marks, there's probably a real name for them somewhere. Um, what you do is you do the black, so you do, you, you do the black dot into the bottom, let it dry completely, let it completely crystallize, all right? Then you'd paint the small red lines across. Then you go in with blue, all right? And you, you just want to swirl that round. You do, if you dial, if you dial uh, your paint right back on here. So yeah, if you dial that, sorry, right in, so you don't, you've got uh, um, this style of um, brush. So that you, you haven't got much forward movement, right? What you want to do then is, facing down, is to spray the blue, all right? Um, and then once that's dry, you would back spray with white. What I did though is I did the black base to it, let it dry, then poured in. I think one of them I did was gold. Once I put the gold in, once that started to dry slightly, I got a I got one near toothpick, and then just up the edges with it flat. Sorry, is I just streak all the lines up, all the way round. Just keep going all the way up, right? Then once those are dried, I've given it a quick mist with uh, gold, and then um, back sprayed it in black, and that's what kind of gave me the dragon eyes. So I did one, I did a row that were black, um, black in the bottom. Then let it set, uh, let it crystallise, fully dry, all right. Then I put blue on top of that, swirled that round a little bit, flecked it all up with a with a stick, all right. Once that had dried. Don't turn it upside down because what I discovered is it just actually runs everywhere and what you're looking for is those really fine lines. Um, then once that had dried, um, I just back sprayed it with, with black, right? A couple of alternatives I did were I, um, I, I put the black dot in the bottom, right? Once that had fully dried, I just misted it with some gold. Um, it was some gold, I did one row with gold and one with white and it, it wasn't like a spray. I literally, from a distance, I held it out and literally went kind of hairspray job, right? Just so you get this light, light misting. Um, and then I put the colour in, did the little spikes with the with the skewer, all right? Once that had fully dried, then I just back sprayed it. So um, not really difficult, just kind of, I was having a play and it was just one application that kind of went through on another. Um, not hugely, not hugely difficult, but it's something that I'm gonna do for, um, and something I'm going to do for Halloween boxes, I'm not going to do all those, I'm just going to put one or two in each box of 12, uh, just to lift it out a little bit, but um, certainly my, my girls thought they looked like dragon eyes, I've never seen dragon eyes, but they call them dragon eyes, so they like those. Um, on top of that, we're going to, yeah, on top of that, I'm going to do, you know, pumpkins and green things and, you know, luminous green fillings and just some stuff that's kind of relevant to um, Halloween. Um, when we get to the end of October, so um, it's time to work on those now. Start to think on those. Though, what I'll do is on my page, I've put all those shells into the. I think there's got. Uh, I think there's some highlights, right? And it's got shells. Um, Q and A sessions. If you go into the shells, if you tap all the way along to the end, there, I'll keep those in there, all right? So, um, I hope that explains that one. Anybody. I will post this onto IGTV later, so that yeah, you can have a look. But basically. Black, let it dry, colour in there, streak it up with, um, while it's still wet, streak it all up with a, uh, a skewer, toothpick, whatever you want to call it. Um, and then when that's dried, I've just back sprayed it with black and it just gives you a kind of nice, um, unusual unusual look to. And I think the black, you know, you see the ones with the black cap, the, the one, uh, the bonbon that I do that's the date and honey um, is almost similar to that technique in that it, um, it's just a, a black cap. When you do that, you'll get the, if you just do a single spray in there and then just let them rest, once that's dried and crystallized fully, then you can go through and paint your mold. Um, black will always give you the best shine. So they're always quite a visually uh, interesting um, design when you do it that way. So 
Um, she, she has joined us. See who else we've got. Uh, Mother Baker saying, it's not far away. The shops here in Northern Ireland are already stocking Christmas goodies. Yeah, do you know? I've just been to a place that's still got Christmas decorations up. So, like, wow. Um, anyway, I hope that explains that one. Um, and I'll get to some questions. Louis Beckett's joined us. Hi, Louis. Um, who else have we got? Oh, my phone is not playing today. Um... Yeah, Nancy. Um, yeah, any you got any questions about that technique? Um, ping me a message or uh, write in the comments. On uh, I'll post a couple of them. Write in the comments, and I'll, I'll go through that. And I'll see if I can. Um, I'm not going to lie. The ones that I did, I kind of filled with the chocolate ganache, and um, they ate them. So, uh, and all I've got left is um, from the stuff I was doing this week. All I've got left is the empty shells which they didn't eat. Um, it's amazing, isn't it? Any work that I've got that's empty, they, they won't touch it, but anything that's filled is like seems to be fair game. So um, I don't let them eat much chocolate, but when they get here, they eat a lot of chocolate. So that's that's my excuse. So, um, yeah, Nadia, give that a go. Yeah, give it a go. Tag me in anything. Um, and yeah, I'll kind of help you with that one. It's quite interesting. Uh, Beehive Online, you're welcome. Um, right, couple of... Couple of questions, yeah. So I've got some interesting questions this week. Um, and I've written them down. I'm super organised this week. Um, one of the big ones um, this is a lady in Iceland. Actually, said to me, "Can I make the fillings? Um, can I make the fillings for the bonbons the day before?" Right. Easy answer is yes, you can. Um, you can. A couple of things though that I think you need to. A couple of things that I think you need to think about. One is that um, you want to make the shells. Um, it's uh, you. You want to make the shells, and you want to try and fill them on the same day, right? That for for in terms of food safety, that's a good practice. If you're doing a big amount, there's nothing wrong with making the making the ganache the day before or the caramel the day before. Don't put it into a piping bag. You need to put it into a container. You probably would. It's called a cartouche, right? But where you put, you wouldn't wrap cling film over the top. What you do is you put cling film over the top and push it down, so you create this lovely seal, right? And then you cling film the top, refrigerate it, and then when you uh, when you come to you, yeah, so refrigerate that overnight, and then you would make the shells the next day. But you would need to warm that ganache up, or you'd need to warm that caramel back up to kind of around about the forty. Um, then put it into your piper bag, then scrape it down, then make sure all the air's out, and then one that when that when that filling gets down to twenty eight, then fill everything up. Um, you don't want to be piping cold ganache into a shell. Because a couple of things will happen. One, it won't find its surface area, so you're going to end up with bubbles in there. The other thing is, and this, this has happened to me, um, when you're piping it in there, uh, this happened to me with uh, marshmallow, right? I was piping it in there, and then when I lifted the piping bag out, the shell was on the end of the, the piping bag. And what should have been a really quick, like that, it was, it was long-winded, and I was having to put every single shell back. And... Then the edges get damaged, and then you can't cap them, and yeah, the problems start from there. So, um, who else we got? Sophie has joined us. Sophie's a really, really old school friend. She's not, no, she's a lovely old school friend of mine from, God, I want to say, early 80s, mid 80s. I don't know, giving the game away. Um, so, the, um, yeah, can I, can I make the fillings the day before? Yeah, the day before is fine. Don't go any further than that. If you've got ganache that's left over, you can put it into small bags, um, wrap it, label it, uh, you can freeze it. When you freeze it, that, uh, the timer stops in terms of biological uh, growth of organisms, right? So if you put it into the fridge, your, your date coding remains the same, all right? So um, if it's been in the fridge seven days, when you put it in a ganache, you need to add those seven days. You can't, or sorry, you need to take those seven days off the shelf life. If that makes sense. So uh, the shelf life is probably most, the most important thing because we're making food to give to people, right? So you certainly don't want to make them ill. But um, there's nothing wrong with making them the day before. I think you just need to be careful of temperature and you need to be careful of the consistency because you want to be able to pipe it. If it doesn't pipe and find its own layer, you're going to have problems. If there's air bubbles in there, what happens is when it when it when it when you turn them out and you leave them to rest, what happens is you end up with, oh, I'm going to draw you the shape, right? Instead of getting a lovely dome, you get this 
it kind of gets sucked in at the sides, right? Um, and you end up with, you know, what should be a lovely dome ends up looking a bit like a bell shape, right? And um, then you're open to all kinds of, of issues if you've got air gaps in there. And we're trying to fill chocolates flush all the way up, no air bubbles, a couple of mils at the top and cap it um, and seal it really well. And that's what gives you your shelf life as well as a well-formulated ganache, if that makes sense. So um, defrost frozen ganache in the re refrigerator. Yeah, um, we're trying to keep things cold. We're trying to keep things safe. You, you've heated the cream up, um, the sugar up. You you know, you've heated it to a certain level. Then you've cooled it down. You put it into your bonbons. Um, if you put it into, I haven't got any bags here. The, if you freeze it in a big squashy piping bag, right, it's going to take ages to defrost. If you put it into, there's an old bag here. You get used to putting them into freezer bags and push them flat. They're only going to be a couple of mil deep. If you put those on the side, they will defrost in minutes, but you've still got to warm it up to about 40. Um, if you don't, you won't be able to pipe it at all. So, um... What's that question there? Will that ganache then crystallize faster? No, not necessarily. The, the, the chains and the molecules, when they... Um, so the sugars will crystallize, the fats will crystallize as well. They will crystallize at a certain temperature in a certain humidity or moisture content. So um, it doesn't speed things up, but if you've got to do a lot, then yeah, it's not a problem to make the ganaches the day before. I tend to do it the other way around. I do the shells first, then I make all the ganache, then I fill them all. And anything that I've got left over, I will put into small bags, wrap it, label it, uh, and I will chill those. Uh, and then I'll freeze them. I don't want to put those from uh, room temperature straight in the freezer because you'll just get ice all over it. Um, and then it starts separating in it. Yeah, you know this stuff, it has its mind its own. So, um, yeah, in terms of can I make fillings a day before? Yeah, answer that one. Um, Another one was about nuts with, uh, so when you're making um, rolled um, truffles, um, so the question was, the nuts that I use give off a lot of oil. A Cu couple of things you can do here with that. I think the first observation, I didn't really see the recipe. Um, there is a saturation point of how much you can get into a truffle mix, right? If there's, the volume of nuts is too much, eventually they're just not going to, they need to be covered, all right? They need to be covered in chocolate. So. Um, you can't fill it so full because when you roll it, they're just not going to adhere, right? Because there's just too much, there's too many straight edges touching too many straight edges and there will be oil microscopically on the surface of the nuts. And if there isn't anything binding them, they are going to spit out more oil. So uh, you get another thing called leaching as well. So when, um, when, there's too much, um, when there's too much of that ingredient in there, when you mix it all, it will, it, it, will, it will cause an imbalance, right? And it will just make the nuts just kind of sink to the bottom and they will not behave at all. Um, the other thing you could do is you roast the nuts and you need to leave them to dry overnight. Uh, you need to leave those to dry overnight. Um, if not, if they're not, they need to be cold. When you take them out of the oven, they will attract a load of moisture. So leaving them to dry overnight will just allow that moisture to, to, to kind of burn off or vapour to, to burn off. Um, <laughs> But also you can put in a little percentage of cocoa butter and just turn them into cocoa butter, rub them all through, leave those to dry. And actually when you put those into your ganache to roll them, you will find that they, uh, they separate much, much better because you won't get flat, flat edges sticking to flat edges. And you see this when people that do panning, when the nuts break in half, half will stick to a whole nut and you'll end up with like a cricket ball in your panning machine. So. Um, yeah, turning in a little bit of um, cocoa butter doesn't hurt to do that one. Um, another question, I got this. I got asked this question a couple of times. Do I need an AW meter? So, um, wait, there's a question before I go to that one. Um, I want to put whole nuts into the shells. Do I need to spray with plain cocoa butter first to keep them crunchy? Um, spraying with cocoa butter isn't going to keep them crunchy. Spraying with cocoa butter is just going to stop them absorbing anything that's uh, surplus. Um, if you want to put nuts, whole nuts into a bonbon, roast them really, really well. Roast them a little bit further, especially hazelnuts, right? Roast them a little bit further than you think they would go. Um, and don't, don't, don't roast them at such a high temperature. Do you know, 140, they're going to brown perfectly. Um, the higher the temperature, they're not going to cook quicker. They're just going to burn faster. So um, make, sure they're, make sure they're well, well roasted and make sure they are dry and make sure they are cold when you put them in. Um, 
don't need to turn them in. Don't need to turn them in cocoa butter. Um, if you're doing them into a truffle, yeah, it's probably it's probably kind of a good thing to do. So um, certainly won't keep them crunchy. Uh, next question was, do I need an AW meter? Do you know if you're home producing? Um, AW meters run into the many thousands. All right, so I use them. Um, I, I use them and I have used them and I do use them in environmental health work where we might be looking for a prosecution for somebody that's making an, an unreasonable claim of shelf life. Um, we will have a look at that, but there are guidelines and um, you know where one country might say an AW of 085 is uh, eight weeks. Uh, another country might say something else, and th there's so much into it. But the AW, all it does is tell you the water, uh, the available water that's left over in the ganache, um, at whatever temperature you set that at. So they're complicated machines. The other thing is that they need calibrating, right? You can't just plug it in and go, well, "Hey, I'm, you know, this is the AW of my ganache." Um, it needs calibrating, and if it's not calibrating, it will start giving you false readings. So if you're a home producer and you're small scale, um, finding a couple of thousand pounds for an AW meter, probably unreasonable, but you'd be better off investing in some other equipment. Um, once you're going upscale and you're starting to sell to, to big shops and the big retail place, places, they want, they want a long shelf life because they might, have a, they might have an insurance policy that says they have to get rid of stock before the three months before its end date. So if it, if it, if it runs out, um, so if it's used by date is, is March, right? They want it yet, they have to get it off their shelf. It depends on their insurance policy. Their insurance policy might say it needs to be out of the store by January or December, right? So they're looking for a longer shelf life. They might be looking for nine months or 12 months. So um, with built into that will be their insurance policy, right? So, so that they don't get anything wrong because when it does go wrong, the fine and the prosecution is, is quite hefty the bigger the retail shop. So, um, AW meters will tell you the water activity, um, but it, what it won't tell you is food handling. It won't tell you uh, gas formulation. Whether it's it'll tell you it's water activity, it won't tell you how long it. It's it's a. It won't tell you how long it'll last. It gives you a guide of how long it's likely to survive before different bacteria get hold of it, or mildews, or spores form, or cyclophiles start kind of exploding and, and producing mildew everywhere. So, um, complicated area. I think that if you're a small producer, an AW meter, you're not going to find that helpful. Um, I find finding a good ganache, um, finding a good ganache, and working on good practice, so good shell formation, um, good ganache uh, piping, making sure it crystallizes properly, capping it properly, storing them properly, wrapping and labeling and doing all that stuff, because all that handling will be in addition to the shelf life, all right? So uh, the, the, better that, uh, the better that food handling is, it's gonna evolve. And you know, you could, you could make a, you know, hypothetically, you could make a ganache some rusty old ingredients and get a, a 0 0.85, um, but then find in a month's time it's got mildew or spot spores all on the inside of it, and it's, your defence can't be, but my AW meter said 0.85. Well, you know what? Your food handling suggested that it only had a week. So um, that's an expensive. Um, the other one was, another question I got was, why don't my shells release? Okay. Um, many things to this one. I don't know if any of you have seen my, um, any of you seen some of my, on my page. I've got one mould. I don't know. I always, every time I find it, I think I'm going to put an X on it. Um, it's always bottom corner or top, yeah, bottom right or top left, right? Um, and every time I turn it out, I always look up and there's this one, and I, or this one angry one. Um, when you make these, you do, you paint it with butter, you shell it with chocolate, you create a vacuum, right? So that's one problem. So they can be vacuumed in. Um, what you do want to do though, is if you put your fingertips over there, when you flip it over, it will leave a little gap so that you'll get a bounce. Right. If you put it flat and just try and slam it down, probably not much is going to happen. You're going to always have a few. But if you can get into the habit of just holding it, your thumbs on the back like that, and flipping it over hard, when that edge touches down, because this isn't level, right, you'll find that they'll crack out a little bit easier. The other thing is shell. So shell structure is the biggest one. Um, if the shells are too thin, they're not going to retract. 
and if the shells don't retract they ain't going to come out and if any of you have suffered this problem where you are I, I, shattered, I shattered one of these ones just in pure anger um, so if it's too thin you end up putting this in the freezer to try and get it to retract some more and then you get moisture build up and eventually they, they will come out all right if the shell is too th the thicker the shell the more it will retract right um, within reason now I know everybody's like oh I've got the thinnest shells great you've got the thinnest shells but do they transport by post because we know super thin shells even with the greatest tempering if they're really really thin uh, they're probably not gonna they're not gonna withstand transport or transit so there's a fine line and there's no definitive guide to what's too thin and what's too thick right it's what you do um, I like chocolate so I'm not hugely impressed by thin shells because I'm buying chocolate and the shells are the chocolate so I I don't feel cheated when they're paper paper thin um, but I do want some kind of structure to it so yeah this obsession of my thin, my shells are the thinnest it's kind of it's like it's a bit like the shelf life like my my bonbon can last nine months who was I talking to flying chocksman and he's like yeah here you go have some chocolates are a year old uh, yeah, no, thank you um, so if they're not releasing it's probably because um, the shells are too thin the other thing could be um, tempering now uh, there'll come a point where there'll, there will come a point where all the molecules line up all right and it will retract it just might not retract as much as anything else and this is why you want to check it well there's one there from yesterday that's why you want to check it on a bit of paper and you want to see that it just curves up a little bit and if it curves up a little bit it's going to retract if you've got streaks on the top of it it's not well tempered right and the retraction and the tempering they're related but they're not so um the thicker the shell the better it will retract the more it retracts the easier it will come out if that answers that one um another question i got is how to make the capping chocolate um oh, i've got that there that is this will be back to front for you i think so this says w2 which is it's w2 caliber and then 10 percent cocoa butter and i'll see the date the date that it runs out right that is w2 with 10% and I think I think for Cappy for four moulds I do no for six moulds I do uh, 200 grams and then 20 grams of cocoa butter uh, melted into it and then just temper it as normal um, the capping if the fluidity of the chocolate is really good and white's normally really good so um, I did that one because I just I had a, the shells I filled them too full right and it left me with like a mill maybe not even that so I needed a more fluid chocolate because I think if I had just poured W2 on there, I'd have just scraped all the filling out, if that makes sense. So, um, very quickly, I just melted some cocoa butter, uh, just melted some cocoa butter, 20 grams of that, 200 grams of chocolate, made it all through, uh, tempered it down very quickly, and then I was able to cap what was a very, very thin shell. I normally leave two mil for me. I'm not obsessed with getting this um, paper thin cap. Uh, my stuff posts and my stuff goes here, there, and everywhere, and it's got to get there. And a decent structured cell shell cell a decent structured cell um will will transport a little bit better and also hold cocoa butter i think a little bit better as well so uh, that was one and then a question about micro i'm not gonna i'm, I'm gonna answer that person separately about how to use micro because um micro i've got one here i don't want to i don't want to advertise it hugely but um two yeah two things Cocoa butter from Casa Luca because it comes in one kilo and I don't want to buy 15 kilos of cocoa butter. And the other one was micro. They pretty much do the same thing. They are literally the same thing. Only this is the, this grated to fine powder on a microplane, right? So um, 1%, warm your warm, warm chocolate up to 34, 1%, stir it through. Just make sure everything's all melted out. Uh, and then once you take it down to your working temperature, it's always a little bit more liquidy as well. So I found, my personal opinion, I've always find that I have to go a little bit lower. So where I might shell white chocolate, I normally shell white chocolate at 30. I kind of have to drop it down to 28 and a half, 28, seven. So, um, and this stuff <coughs> ain't cheap, but if I'm doing anything over three kilos, I'll use that. Um, I, you know, I came across this in the, in the mid nineties. I was working, I was in a, uh, in a three mission star kitchen and we were given this and we used to dip scallops in it and then fry them because this was never for chocolate work. This was for savoury kitchen um, 
and then the pastry guys start to use it and then the pastry guys start to steal it and then we didn't use it because we would just use olive oil right so um but yeah one percent warm chocolate to 34 one percent there's lots of videos online on how to use that um i've never ever seen a different uh, brand of it though so and then obviously the silk which is a totally different thing that which is produced at 33 and a bit degrees so um that's i hope answers that one um See if there's any other questions. Um, what else? One second. Uh, right. Oh my lordy, there's a whole load of questions here. Sorry. One second. Bear with me. Um, so that's the one about the nuts. That's it. So um, I've just put baked hazelnuts in with just caramel and they were crunchy. Yeah, do you know the nuts... The nuts will remain crunchy for 10 days. It's a bit like when you, you know, you do the, um, the fuillotine, you know, the crunchy layer, right? So I use biscuit. I don't use fuillotine. I just don't think it's worth the money. Um, so I'll use biscuit and I'll do 25% biscuit, 75% um, chocolate, white chocolate generally. Um, so it remains crunchy for about 10 days. And after that, it just starts to lag a little bit. But, you know, the nuts, um, you know, if it's well formulated caramel and it's firm enough, um, and to get it firm, you certainly once on my page, you can add percentage of butter to it. I think I said, like, if you wanted a more chewy one, the recipe that's on there, add an additional, I think I said an, another 30 grams of butter. Uh, will just help everything net a little bit more, and it'll be a bit firmer. But the nut will sit in the middle of that, um, rather than sink to the bottom. So, but they'll stay crunchy for 10 days. They'll be fine. And I think you all know my feelings about shelf life for more than two weeks. I just kind of know. Um, chocolate escapade um, Melissa I got your I saw your email that's that's um, you asked me about framed ganache and you asked me about piped ganache and it's a really really technical question so I will I will answer it I've been uh, been quite a busy boy this week so um, I did get that I will answer that but it's about formulas and it's about percentages and it's about ratios and it's quite a complicated uh, it's quite a complicated answer for that one Technically, you could take a formed ganache and and use that. Only formed ganache, and we do forms, so we do enrobing. Um, they're a lot, lot firmer because they the shell is put on afterwards. So um, and it's not really a vessel. Do you know if there's any issue with that centre, it will leak through. All right. So um, I will answer you, Melissa, that one separately, and I'll, I'll I'll give you my thoughts on the formulas for that. So. Um, so can ghee be used in a ganache to keep the water content down um, yeah ghee is a fat right um, ghee is a fat but it's quite um, how do I explain this I, we use ghee in cooking so um, so a lot of Middle Eastern cooking and some of the like Pan-Asian Asian foods um, it has got its very distinct smell and aroma to it so and in chocolate I've seen it used I've heard of it used um, Ghee is a fat, it will bind up, it will bind up water as well as sugar. So whether you are using glucose, whether you are whether you're using sucrose, so sugar, whether you're using glucose, whether you are using sorbitol, whether you are using, you know, any of the other um, sugar alcohols, it will it will bind, it will bind up the water. Um, can you use it as a substitute? You can you can swap a fat for a fat. You need to see what the content, the fat content is. You know, butter is normally about eighty-four percent fat. So, um, you you just need to. B is uh, sorry, ghee is probably a little bit more refined than that. I would have thought it's up in the nineties, ninety-five percent. So, um, certainly when you open the tin, it's rock hard, isn't it? So, um, it's it's a very very solid fat. Yes, yes, you can substitute it, um, but it has its own aroma. So if you're doing it with spices and you're doing it with curries or you're doing it with some something that's kind of relevant um, to that area, yeah, absolutely, it's fine to swap one fat for another. Um, like, this is a question I got asked recently. Um, does brown sugar make a better, better caramel than white sugar? Sugar, sugar, sucrose is sucrose, right? They, they all do the same thing. Um, my work that I did with Tate and Lyle, I just know that the, um, the Muscovados, they're blended. So that's not just like tip a load of raw cane juice into a, an evaporator and crystallize it. They take different ones and they blend different elements to get the different, because you can get light muscovado, uh, you can get some of the spiced muscovados there. And certainly the work with Tate and Lyre, we were looking at all those qualities for sugars. Um, 
Yes, you can swap them like for like, but you're going to have a colour change and you are going to have a viscosity change. But in terms of the molecular structure and how that they behave, sucrose is sucrose. They are all the same. Um, quite like caramels done with different sugars as well. That actually keeps things interesting. So, um, yeah, so best technique to seal bonbons. Um, we always get to this one, don't we? Um, I used to maybe do a video on it, right? Um, spray your cocoa butter, dumb your shell. Um, I'm not going to show you in a minute. And I got there's like they're not sh they're not horseshoes. They're they're bonbon molds, right? So that will lead into this actually. So you do your shells, um, and whether they go this way once you shell or that way, I'll explain that one in a minute, right? Because I've done some really artistic drawings for it. So um, the best way to shell. You, um, once you've got your filling in there and it has fully crystallised, don't do it while it's still soft. You need to leave this overnight, somewhere cool, somewhere protected, not in the fridge. Um, they need to crystallise on their own. All right. The the trick the trick to capping uh, there's a couple of tricks. Some people uh, put a hairdryer over it. That's fine. All that is is to melt that very very edge. If you don't like to, I don't like doing that. I, I put the chocolate on top and then I scrape and then I leave them on the side. A lot of people, they scrape them and they just in a real hurry to get those into the fridge. Don't, just leave them out and it will continue to find its own layer and that's where you get really lovely smooth caps, all right? Um, the best way to cap is um, to leave yourself a little bit of room, all right? If it's too thin or it's too domed, the filling, you can end up having problems. The other problem is too much chocolate on the top. When I talked about weighing everything, so you know how much to put on. I know that when I come to do the, do the caps, uh, 110 chocolate is enough to do the whole top of here and scrape it flush, all right? Um, you need a good scraper, check that it hasn't got holes in it. This one, I, you know, I can see daylight underneath that. So this one needs replacing for me shortly. Um, fluidity of chocolate. Nothing wrong with using your three drop cho chocolate, just add 10% cocoa butter to it and keep it, where is it? As I as I make them, I just keep them separate. All right, they go in a box in the dark. But um, once I've once I've made them, and I'll just use that for capping only. All right, um, don't normally need to do that with white because it's quite a fluid chocolate and it, it's quite forgiving and it doesn't show lots of marks, stri striation marks or scrape marks. Um, but for milk and for dark, yeah, I'll do ten percent and I'll just keep them separate so that they are ready to grab. So I'm not melting a whole load more chocolate. If that makes sense. So. Um, um, everybody's on truffles. No PDF. Um, no, no Pat de Free questions tonight. Yeah. Um, hello from Palestine in Gaza. Hello. Um, can you enroll ganache in a bonbon? Yeah. Oh uh, wait. No. Can I what? Can I enrobe? That doesn't make sense. Can I use an enrobed ganache? In a bonbon. That's what you're asking me. Um, yes, but they're formulated to be a lot, lot firmer. All right. Um, it depends whether you want. I like. I like. I don't like fillings that are rock hard. Um, I had a. I had a hazelnut praline recently, and it was rock hard. And it's not. I kind of. I like them soft, slightly not liquidy, but slightly soft. All right. So the problem with. Um, in robe ganache, you know, framed ganaches is is they are a lot lot firmer than pineapple ganaches, right? For for a very good reason. So, um, so I'm thinking to keep crispy, layer crispy. Maybe better to go with brown butter and say, yeah, brown butter. Um, once you brown butter, yeah, it takes on a lovely flavour. So, I wore my scraper a bit more scraping my caps. Yeah, absolutely. Um, not hot, all right. Just, just, just warm it. Um, same thing I would say with you know spatulas when you're going between batches. Um, just give it a little warm, all right, uh, as you're going between different bowls because that will help you as well. And all you need to do is is introduce a tiny bit of untempered chocolate into another bowl, and you see how quickly that stuff spreads. It's it's worse than the Rona virus. So. Um, What's the difference between cheap $10 non-brand polycarbonate and, for example, Martello? Um, 
I can't find anything better than Martello here. Right, well, Martello is really good. Um, the difference is the thickness, the difference will be the thickness of the polycarbonate, right? Uh, and the polish. And what they do is they make these, when they do, when they, when they actually make these, it kind of almost looks like a, a bullet end, all right? And they're highly, highly polished and they force those in. The cheaper, uh, the cheaper and thinner, the, there's different grades of polycarbonate. They come in little pellets, right? They go into the machine, they're melted down, they're injected in, the press comes in and slams it, and then this thing comes off, right? So um, the cheaper they are, I think you'll find that not every single uh, cavity will be the same. I think you'll find the polycarbonate doesn't, it's very thin, it doesn't have any flex in it, and I think you will also find with the very, very, very cheap ones, um, when you go to crack them out, you might find they shatter. Um, you need you need good if you you need good molds. What you don't need is lots of different molds. So decide on a variety that you're going to um, decide on the variety that you want to make, so that, that fits your packaging and buy the molds that you want for that packaging. Um, you need good molds. You need good chocolate. Um, you don't have to have the world's greatest scraper. You don't have to have you know the most um, amazingly coloured spatulas and you know this trendy piping bag and black gloves that are for tattoo artists you don't you don't need all that stuff you need a good temperature probe you need good molds and you need good chocolate um, even the cocoa butters I dare say there's a there's a huge variety on the market um, buy the ones that you can afford of those and learn to get the best from them and if that means the colors you need to add titanium or white to it you can add God, I do this all the time you can add white cocoa butter to your ready premium, like a red, and get you know a, a lighter shade. Or you can mix them in a separate pot. I was doing that. I had to remix a purple. Um, I had to remix a purple because it just was too too. It was just too light. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't go. For, don't try, don't do the cheap molds. You know, even if you had to just buy ten of the more expensive ones instead of twenty of the cheaper ones, um, I would do that and I'd let that work for itself because they. They will last. If you look after the moulds, they will last. The cheap, thin ones, uh, they break, they buckle, they get scratched easily. Um, false economy, that one, I think. Um, if that answers that one. Um, chef, I like, sorry I'm late. <laughs> I don't think you're late, mate. I think we're nearly finished. Um, not really, no. I don't have a scraper. Is it okay to do with a pastry one? Um, yeah, do you know what? When I was in hotels, when I was in hotels, we had metal rulers. We had metal rulers because pallet knives were pallet knives were a bit too bendy, right? So when you went to scrape, you'd end up like flicking chocolate halfway across the wall. So we would use a metal root a metal ruler, right? And they were brilliant. Um, they were really really good. So uh, it just needs to be a straight edge, and you need to check that it's a straight edge, and you need yeah just make sure that that's true. But if you want to check it, put it up against the window and just see that you haven't got air gaps. Uh, you can see daylight through it because. That very often is the culprit to poor capping. Um, that and chocolate that's not fluid enough. Um, um, my issue is always to put too much filling in and then have such a thin cap. That's practice, Mother Baker. You, you, you. Um, it helps also. A lot of people will stand over it and pipe. If you can get this a little bit higher up, right, and you can pipe from behind it, you'll see you'll be looking at this leading edge, right? So if you can pipe with your hand round the other way, um, that, that, that helps in terms of a little trick. But uh, I think the trick to piping is practicing piping. Um, so um, what's the best probe? I have many. Um, I have many and I check them regularly. Uh, I probably need to buy a new one in terms of my, my laser one. I'm not 100% I'm not sure that that's being very accurate with me at the moment. So, um, there's so many on the market. I don't think the most expensive one is the best, and I don't think the cheapest is the worst. Um, I think with probes, you need to look after them, and you need to make sure the batteries are changed regularly on them as they as the batteries get older. Um, they definitely that loss of power. They stop being as accurate. Um, buy what you can afford. You need both though. You need you need a stick probe. Uh, and you need a laser one. The laser one will give you surface temperature of everything. So if I want to do the find out the temperature of my mould, if I want to know the temperature of my cabinet, 
I can spray in there. If I want to do the temperature of my fridges, I can just point the laser in there. Uh, whereas the probe, yeah, you need that for chocolate and you need that for cocoa butter because that needs to be very, very accurate, right? Um, which air spray do I recommend? Compressor I use is a Sparmax. Um, it's a 620TC uh, or a TC620. Um, but I have others. There's others. There's one here that I coach with. So, um, but it's all about the air. It's all about the compressor, right? It's not about. It's not about having the trendiest gun. Um, I can do a lot with a good compressor, a cheap gun, but I can't do a lot with an expensive gun and a cheap compressor. So, uh, put the money into the compressor. It will. You know, it will pay for itself. So, what are your thoughts on mixing different pre-coloured cocoa butters of different brands? Not a problem. Cocoa butter's cocoa butter. Um, the varieties around the world will have slightly different aromas, slightly different taste to them. But the actual the cocoa butter that's coloured, by the time all the pigments in there, um, pretty equal actually. I'd have an issue mixing them. Um, I got some Roxy and Rich ones, which I've been playing with. Um, problem I've got is um, I said a few weeks back that I'm colour blind, so I sprayed a load of colours, and then I looked at it and went, I can't, I can't see anything. And I've got one there. I've got one there and it's like well it's white and then my little girl came in and went no 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 it's turquoise in there so there's nothing wrong with there's nothing wrong with mixing colors and I think the advantage of that is that you start to develop your own style and your own palette and I would wholeheartedly encourage that I use oh uh, yeah I've got this you can tell I've got daughters can you I've got this lovely little pink heart thing um, you already see I'm mixing colours in there, right? And I'll put a blue, and I'll mix some white into it so that I can get a bit more um, opacity to it. Um, you know, I will put yellow in, and I'll mix green into it just to give me, a, you know, a better shade. There's a red that I've got that I'll put more black into just to give me a darker, darker shade. So um, you're painting, and you're being creative, and you're being artistic, and I think what sets you all apart. Well, what should set you all apart is if you experiment with your colours and come up with the, you know, I like big bold colours, but I like big bold colours because I can see them. Um, the lighter colours I really struggle with. I have to get some help to say, like, well, what have I done here? Does this look nice? So, um, yeah, Nadia, go for it. Um, okay, chef, I need to make apple caramel. What's the temperature should be? Alat, there's an apple caramel on my, um, on my page. Um, you go on to the recipes. There's an apple caramel there uh, with all the temperatures on it. There was a lady, I think a lady in, where is she? I think she's in Iceland, she could be in Sweden, but she did that today and really liked it. I posted that earlier on my on my page, so. Um, um, I love pink. Right, shall I just explain what this is? Right, this. When you do, you can't read this. So this is a mould, right? So this one is facing up. You can't read this because it's probably back to front now, isn't it? Um, and then these ones are facing down. What I wanted to explain is when I, and this question comes up a lot, right? So when I shell with dark, all right, once I put the chocolate in um, and I tip everything out and I tap it, right? And then I scrape the bottom a couple of times. I wait until all the drips have gone, yeah? And then, dark I turn upside down yeah because I get this little lip form here right the shady bit is actually the chocolate I get this lip form because it's a more brittle chocolate all right um, I don't like blow torching it I'm sorry I don't like doing a hair dryer on it yeah so once that once that's shelled I end up with this this angle down right um, and I'll fill it and then I don't warm it, what I do is I'll put the chocolate on and then I'll leave it at room temperature once I've scraped and I find that that adheres and sticks perfect for me with dark chocolate, right? With um, milk and white, this is what happens, so this one here is not horseshoe shaped, so you've shelled that way round, yeah? And then you've tapped everything out, all right? And then you leave it upside down all the way and then you wait for the drips, right? And then when it's crystallised, what they'll do then is they'll give it a scrape. But what happens is, what happens is you end up with these little void areas here. So that when you actually go in now to pipe your filling in, and your filling, 
comes up to where are we? your filling comes up to kind of here, right? You end up with this. You end up with this little area here, all right? And um, very difficult to get the chocolate underneath underneath that, right? Um, and that can be a challenge. What I'm really after with milk and white is not so much of this angle but with milk and white so what I will do is I will shell it I'll tap them out I'll I'll I'll, um, I'll tap it out till it's completely gone all right then I'll turn it upside down for literally a minute all right and it will just let all the chocolate sink back down again then I'll flip it over and I'll leave it to crystallize upside down all right and it just gives me a much better edge like that and I find that that works for me so I just wanted to explain that one because I get asked that one so so often um, Fancy Nancy's just bought a pink KitchenAid why? you want boys colour camouflage it's um what else? what else? some other baker likes pink too um, any other questions? anything else anybody's got? I don't know what the time is it's gone half past we've had an hour already wow that went quick didn't it? Um, if there is anybody else anybody else got any other questions I don't have anything else to go through this week I'll show you this one so these were just little things that I were doing for I'm looking at for um, with the new colors that I've got I'm just trying to understand them a little bit I've had to um, I've had to do a little lot of um, uh, I've had to do a lot of adjusting with those colours um, and spraying with the pearl. Um, I think I think that's yeah well, probably one of the most frustrating things. I just could not get I could not get the pearl to sit evenly. Um, so it might be I just need to wait until the the, the moulds are a lot lower in temperature and down at the, the if the mould you know we always talk about it being under twenty one right but. You know, when the mould is at 18 and you spray, it sticks instantly, right? When the mould is 17 and you spray, you can end up with some really lovely uh, technique. If you do the one where you drop the cocoa butter in the bottom and put the colour on top, when this mould is around about um, kind of 17, 16, 17 degrees, which is quite cold, right? Once you spray, it sets al almost immediately and you can get good luster dust to go through it as well. And you'll get that kind of... Um, yeah, really lovely metallic fleck that goes through it. So, um, yeah, it's a case, you know, temp temperature is everything, right? Temperature is absolutely everything. Uh, temperature and technique, it's not about recipe. Um, why sh chocolate shell stick on the mould? Copper coffee, I don't explain that. Um, Fancy Nancy, did you see my truffle question? I'm going to have to scroll all the way at the top. Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Um, Nancy, what's the question again? I can't find it. Uh, oh, there's so many questions here, I can't get to them all. Nancy, what was that question again about the truffles? And I'll see if I can get to it. I'll scribble it down quick. Um, what is what's that? What is your fave? She asked. You guys are confused. Me now. <laughs> is it no? Um, my favourites. What the the shells that I did the other night. I'm liking this one. Maybe it won't hold it up on that finger because that's just a bit. Um, I liked this one. Um, I just couldn't get the colours dark enough. I had to kind of play with it a little bit. Um, that's one I liked. There was a so this one was called fuchsia pink, but pink and yellow are two colours. I, I don't see them very well. Uh, red and red and brown, red and brown, green and brown, pink and yellow, pink and yellow. Yeah, the real challenge for me. So this one was supposed to be um, fuchsia, but um, yeah, that was kind of cute. So um, it's really about getting the shades right for me more than anything. So. Um, right, I've been reading about making truffles and haven't as yet. Some pipe rather than roll. What's your take? Um, depends on your volume, right? If you've got best thing with with truffles, if you've got a guitar cutter, um, pipe lots of lines and just put a guitar cutter down because they're quicker to do. Um, either or, 
pint if you're making slightly larger truffles so if they're like the 10 15 16 17 gram size um, and that's that's a couple of bites right um, piping is probably easier I've always found that piping taking a, uh, a plain nozzle that's a um, half inch nozzle and just piping a lovely long line letting it set and going along and cutting it I've always found that a little bit easier for me um, if you let the if you let the ganache set too hard, it becomes harder to roll. All right, so um, the trick is the trick is finding that even area. If you're doing them by hand, if you pipe long lines, um, you want to cut them before they've set, but you want to cut them um, not before it's too liquidy. Otherwise, they'll join back together. Um, it's a fine line. Um, either or, if I'm doing lots, I'll pipe lines. If I'm doing just a few, like maybe if I'm doing maybe if I'm doing a hundred. Um, I will pipe them, but you know, if it's much, much more than that, then I will, um, I will pipe them. If they've got nuts in them, they're easier to pipe. When you pipe the lot, they're easier to pipe lumps, right? When they are, uh, but they've got a lot of inclusions in them, <laughs> they become more difficult to pipe in straight lines, uh, and you can't quite get the, um, yeah, you can't quite get the shape that you want to. So, uh, yeah, rolling seems messy. It is. Uh, Okay. Right. Right, I've got to go, guys. Um, I will post this on a little bit later. Um, I hope you have a lovely weekend, and thank you for joining me again.